Hello and welcome to Sensei Podcast. This is Manos Brilakis discussing with leaders in the field of CTO and Complex PCI. Sensei means teacher or master in Japanese. The goal of the Sensei Podcast is to help you learn and improve in CTO and Complex PCI so that you can become the best that you can be and offer your patients the best possible results. Hello and welcome to Sensei Podcast. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Ahmed El Guindi, who is the director of the Cat Lab at the Aswan Heart Center in the Magdi Yacoub Foundation. Um, Ahmed, again, welcome to the podcast and thanks for joining us today. Hi, Manos. No, thank you. It's an absolute honor to be with you today. Thank you for the invitation. So, Ahmed, I know that you have been one of the forces of CTO and Complex PCI in Egypt and actually Middle East and beyond. But how did you actually start? I know it's something that can be difficult to learn and that the resources may not be always the easiest to find uh, in Egypt. How did this start for you and how was your journey? So, my journey was a bit unorthodox compared to sort of what you would, uh, how you would see a, a CTO operator evolve in the West. So I obviously come into the game much later than you did and many of the people who, who you've hosted on your podcast, but it was pretty difficult because I had a mentor, an Italian mentor, uh, David Antonucci, who was absolutely fantastic. He was, uh, he was a, a very seasoned, complex PCI operator, but wasn't really a CTO guy as such. And I learned a lot from David and uh, a rotational atherectomy, left main stenting, so all the complex stuff. But it was really when we got into the CTO sphere that things started to look a bit odd. Uh, he would occasionally use microcatheters. He would routinely use dual injections. So the, the very basic setup was there. But at some point, we just, okay, so we need to go retrograde. And we're not sure which wire, which collateral. Something was a bit odd. And I, and I wasn't fully... I was getting a bit frustrated, in all honesty, because I think, yeah, there's a lot I don't understand, and I'm sure that there's a better way of doing this. And that was back in 2011, 2012. I briefly moved to the uh, structural sphere, uh, so I did a lot of tabbies back then. And I think the breakthrough was back in 2014. Your book was out. Um, I went to the, I think it was the first or second edition of MLCTO, in Nice, and it's sort of someone just, it's like a bulb lit, and um, I'm back uh, uh, between 2014 and 2015, 150 CTOs, and sort of everything started to make a lot of sense. So yeah, it was, wasn't really a, a proper mentorship as such, but sort of interrupted interest, and we obviously had a lot of patients coming in with CTOs, uh, young patients who are very symptomatic, so there was the need was there. Perfect. So there was a need, many patients, and you had some training, but then actually it's fascinating to hear it was the meeting and what you saw there that motivated you and gave you the foundation to get to get better and start learning those techniques. Yeah, yeah, mostly yes. And then how uh, did things evolve? You start doing more and more cases, obviously you are more and more successful. Uh, you're doing more and more complex cases. Uh, what did you find the most difficult thing to learn? Uh, I think things back then, it was starting to shape up. I think compared to uh, back in 2005, 2006, uh, it wasn't really as structured as it was when I came into the game. So 2014, 2015, you, you were doing a lot of work. Uh, I obviously did not know you in person back then. But I was really following your, your book, your, your, uh, your YouTube channel, and there were a couple of other online resources. There was CTO Fundamentals back then. You and Cal were, were publishing cases and the discussions. So it was a very rich environment on the whole. And I think I made use of that for uh, the first couple of years uh, and gradually building up my own experience. And then it was from there, I think it was uh, sort of on the right track. It was uh, getting to know. Uh, more seasoned and experienced operators from all around the world, brushing shoulders. Then, uh, I mean, it just everything plugged easily and, and went smoothly from there. Perfect. And how do you prepare? Have, have things changed in the way you prepare for these cases right now? Do you do anything special uh, for the cases you plan to do? 
So not really. We do. I obviously want to know everything about the patient I'm treating. So it's not just the coronary angiogram. I want to make sure that he or she is indicated for the procedure. I want to know every bit of clinical information about the background. What is the pattern of symptoms? What are the expectations? And um, then I, I get into more of the, the details on the, on the laboratory side. Then we review the angiogram. And I think uh, what, I, what I'm doing nowadays that is slightly different in, in compared to when we started is we actually used to write the plan down and hang it on the wall. That comes mostly from the structural side as well because we'd have our, our, our autogram or our, 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 all the measurements hung up on the wall. Uh, we used to do the same with coronary work. I don't do that any longer, but uh, I still spend a decent amount of time reviewing that with the whole team. And I think it's uh, having more than one pair of eyes helps. But also, even for the primary operator, even if you're operating in, uh, in, uh, in a place where there's very limited CTO experience, just looking at the angiogram and spelling out your plan in words and explaining it to fellows around you or colleagues who are not, who might not be as experienced, uh, sort of allows you to streamline your thought process. And okay, so this is going to be plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D. So it's not just something lingering in the back of my head. I actually have to put it into words and then it becomes clear for everyone. And you've done a lot of cases, live cases. How is the mental part? Do you get stressed out at all? Do you get anxious? I mean, you always seem so calm in doing those cases. Uh, do you really feel calm? Do you ever get stressed out? I mean, I, I must have gotten better at hiding it. But yeah, I mean, being, I mean, being live or not, if, if, if I'm faced with, obviously, the first couple of times were, were stressful, and then it becomes uh, more or less, uh, you want to manage the time, you want to manage the discussion, you want to make it interesting. So that's... Uh, as you mature, it becomes the, the stress moves to this arena rather than is it going to be a successful procedure? Are you going to be able to do it or not? But um, I think whenever I'm faced with a complex case, I would spend some time of the night thinking about, okay, so what am I going to do tomorrow? So it would be at the back of my head, I'll be trying to figure out how to do it in a safe and efficient way. Uh, but uh, nowadays, I, I don't get nervous or stressed or anxious unless... And I occasionally, because I do a lot of traveling, uh, if I feel that I'm operating in an unsafe environment, and if that hits me somewhere at the beginning of the case or during the case itself, I think this is the, the, the bit where I still get anxious a bit. Yeah. And when it comes to the part where things don't go the way you expect, which happens to everyone, sometimes things don't happen, complications happen. Um, how do you handle those? Do you have a special kind of inner source, inner peace? How do you keep calm and manage these complications? So I think that the worst things happen when you don't understand what's going on. I think this is the, the major source of frustration. So the usually the, the first thing I would try to pick up is, okay, so we have a problem. Do I fully understand what's going on? And once I reach that point, I think everything becomes relatively smooth because you, you know you have an algorithmic approach to it. You can uh, move to an extended algorithm. You can uh, improvise if it's not something that has been well described before. But without understanding what exactly is going on or what is, why is your patient hypotensive, it becomes uh, quite alarming. So, yeah, I focus what's wrong. And sometimes to figure out what's wrong, you really need to both zoom in on the, on the very fine details but also occasionally you want to zoom out and see what's happening on the bigger picture. So is it a, a retroperitoneal bleed, for instance? Is your, if, are you having a hematoma that is oozing? Um, has a wrong medication been given, which has occasionally happened? So it's, it's a combination of being able to zoom in and zoom out during the complication. Wonderful. Are there some cases that have taught you a lot that either good or bad ones that you had a lot of a lot of learning from those cases. No, I guess somehow the the bad cases are the ones that tend to stick to memory, huh? and um, it's yeah, it's the, the complications that um, I wouldn't say exactly depressing cause your depression, but yeah, you you dwell a lot about the complications and when things don't go right, and I think the first thing I do is just 
after that doesn't last a lot. And after that, I usually uh, sit initially alone, just reflect and try to digest, okay, what went wrong? I revise everything I did during the procedure. But I also do the same exercise with the team. And um, I would sort of try to figure out, okay, so how could I have done things different, differently? Would this complication uh, have been avoided? And occasionally I would consider, I, I mean, would I still take this patient back again into the cath lab if uh, I know what I know? So in hindsight, was this the right indication? Was the risk-benefit ratio really worth it? Uh, so it's not just about how successful am I uh, or unsuccessful at opening the vessel. I would just revise and see, okay, I might have had a higher threshold for this anatomy and say, okay, the pattern of symptoms, it's, not just, it's just not worth the risk. So yeah, I, I, I just revise everything and try to come up with one or two learned lessons, essentially to avoid doing the same mistake in the future. And then when it comes to the uh, cases that take a long time and you get a lot of radiation and contrast, do you get concerned about the radiation dose that you are getting with the number of cases you are doing both at home as well as abroad? So, yeah, I've, I've spoken to you about that and you've been uh, instrumental at sort of reorienting my thought towards radiation. I, I come from a place where radiation safety measures are pretty lousy on the whole. So uh, in terms of how you would look after radiation to the team, to yourself and to the patient, wasn't exactly tip top. So I think over the years, this is one of the major areas where we've uh, made a lot of progress. It nowadays is, is one of my primary concerns. It's not just about what your success rate is, is can you do it in a shorter time with less radiation, with less contrast? And yeah, uh, I think when we first joined Progress CTO, we were like, three times the average dose of radiation. And I'm now happy to see it fall down to sort of the, the, the average we're getting across the, the entire registry. Yeah, that's a particularly important area, especially when you operate in an environment that is not really oriented or focused on uh, cutting radiation. Wonderful. You teach many people. I know there is uh, every meeting we do, there is a lot of uh, fellows and trainees from Egypt, from Ashwan specifically. So you've taught many people. What makes you excited about teaching someone? Is there something in their attitude, their skills? How do you decide who you're going to treat or not? So yeah, I, I think I focus on two elements. It's the, uh, the attitude part and the skill. I mean, the attitude, do they have the grit? Do they have the... Uh, the proper mindset, that uh, sort of sweet balance or sweet spot, uh, humility-wise and confidence-wise. So you want to have someone who's confident but not overconfident. They also need to be humble and be able to just figure out that, you know, I've done this in the wrong way. I'm going to come back and say, you know, this is not the right way of doing it. I want to learn how to do it properly. Uh, they need to be hard workers, obviously. And I think it's, it's really the attitude that makes a huge difference. Now, we obviously want the skill in terms of dexterity, in terms of 3D orientation. Uh, but I, I would say that comes as the, the, the second step. It's the second priority. You obviously need a minimal threshold of skill and talent uh, to be able to teach them. But uh, I guess you can get uh, someone with the right attitude, with a perfect attitude, and average skills to become a very good operator. But the opposite is not exactly true. And obviously, if you have superb skills, then that's, that's a very much a welcome addition. And what do you find to be the hardest thing to teach the fellows or the trainees that are with you? Are there specific techniques? Is the wire? Is the microcatheter? Is it the thinking? What, what is the hardest thing to teach the fellows? I think, Manus, it's, it's mostly it's, it's a mental exercise. I mean, at the end of the day, I, I work, very closely with our surgeons here. And they do a lot of uh, two and two and a half kilogram babies with switches and truncuses and so forth. And I just look at the, the dexterity and skill set. I mean, that's, that does require a lot of dexterity. So yeah, uh, when it comes to CTO, PCI, or complex PCI on the whole, I think it's the, the mindset that I battle with a lot. It's the decision-making process. It's just making sure that this person knows when to do what and when to stop. 
the second thing I think I, I I find difficult to teach is how to accept failure, and um, because you, you don't want them to be sort of a quitter, you want to go in with a winning mentality. We're going to be successful at this, but you also want the level of wisdom uh, that would tell you, okay, so this is the time to stop. Um, I think this only comes with time and maturity, but yeah, it's it's quite difficult to to teach this, at least not in a reproducible fashion. And are there some things that have helped you uh, go through this process? Do you like um, meditate or write or uh, exercise? How do you keep yourself fit mentally and uh, physically to be able to do these cases? So, yeah, I, I think I, I try to stay fit. So, yeah, I swim um, uh, whenever I have the chance to, mostly regularly. But uh, I think one thing I've learned over the past few years is I'm getting better sleep nowadays. So I used to sleep like three or four hours a day and I actually used to take pride in that. And uh, over the past few years, I just came to realize that I'm probably more efficient and definitely more alert and I feel better when I get five or six hours sleep. So I think this is the, the thing I've added uh, the past three or four years is trying to get better sleep plus exercise. This is, as you know, this is a very physically demanding uh, job and it's not just physically demanding. If you're physically drained, you're also mentally drained. So I try to keep physically fit and to sleep. For most people, five, six hours would not probably be enough, but it looks like you can flourish even <laughs> unlimited amounts. Yeah. So this is wonderful. Um, what do you think is the value of um, uh, the things that you've done that means the most to you? What are you the most proud of? So yeah, on on a, on a professional level, I think the, the most fulfilling part is being able to uh, have a positive impact on my patients' lives. So uh, you would know that we get coronary artery disease in this side of the world uh, at a much younger age compared to the West. So on average, they'd be 10, 12 years younger. So you'd occasionally be faced with a 50-year-old gentleman post-cabbage uh, all grafts have failed in a triple CTO, an EF of 20%, and they're, they're effectively disabled. So being able to, to see this person back on their feet, back to the work, enjoying life, I think that is uh, the most fulfilling part of the job, I would say. Um, on, the, on, a, on, a more, on a broader scale, I think over the past uh, two to three years, I'm also enjoying seeing my members of my team grow as well. So uh, I'm, I'm sitting back now, we're running a Tabby workshop downstairs and they're doing live transmissions, I'm not even there. So it's, uh, it's becoming a, a source of amusement and uh, I would say pride for me. Wonderful. And then what excites you the most right now? What are the things you're most excited for now and for the next few years? Yeah, I, I think, I hope I remain to be excited about CTOs and complex PCIs. But the, uh, I, I like what I do. I think it's, uh, it's passion that drives uh, the vast majority of us. And uh, uh, as long as I'm able to do what I'm doing and still enjoy it and be passionate about it, I just see myself doing it forever. I mean, forever is, is uh, forever, you know what I mean. I mean, as long as I'm able to, I'll just, I, I don't yeah. think that there's anything else that would uh, draw my attention. My, I mean... On a more personal level, my, my, my wife used to tease me that my universe starts and ends inside the cath lab. And I think it, it was mostly, it was for 10 years, everything that meant anything to me was inside the cath lab. I'm, I'm barely out of there. But it was COVID that sort of, okay, so there's a much bigger world outside, bigger problems. And yeah, I'm starting to, to start to look outside and have that uh, sense of balance. But I'm... I'm should be in the cat lab for quite some time. Good. So no, no, no news, no plans for retirement for you, which is good news for your patients. Yeah. Um, do you have any favorite book or any favorite movie? Yeah, only, yeah, I do a lot of reading on mostly politics, but, but you know, we come in a very, uh, it's a very difficult area politically, uh, geopolitically, I mean. And uh, so, I, so, so I like reading into politics. Uh, there's a there's a strong element of history attached to that as well. 
but when it comes to movies, I think uh, the Shawshank Redemption, Redemption would be my favorite movie. It's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's a very interesting display of how uh, hope and perseverance and, uh, I mean, hard work for years uh, can eventually pay off with a bit of creativity. Wonderful. And speaking of creativity, I know you've come with some a lot of creative solutions to, you know, CTO problems and PCI problems, but also you can handle the structural work with Tavi. How, how do you manage those two areas? So uh, many people say, you know, you should only be doing one area or peripheral or structural, but you're able to manage the whole spectrum fairly well. So how are you able to manage those different types of, of patients and cases as well? Um, I guess I'm, I'm privileged to be working where I am. It's a very... We started off as a very young group, limited number of physicians. So we've interacted early on very closely between surgeons, cardiologists, uh, the imaging guys, intensivists, and so forth. And that has given us sort of a broad base. Um, it was it was very easy to start structural work. I don't do any congenital work, uh, but the, the the structural side was again built on demand. And the incredible support I had from the team just made it feel easier, made it become easier. Um, I think that I made a lot of use of the cross-training bit. So when we got into the MCS era, and you know that we, we have a lot of difficulties with impellers because they're, they're expensive, they're occasionally unavailable. So we do a lot of ECMOs for protective PCI over here, occasionally love our ECMOs. So coming from a structural background where you're routinely managing large bore vascular access, I think has made things easier to a great extent. I'm not sure that this would be my advice to, to fellows nowadays. Uh, I think they're becoming very distinct uh, subspecialties nowadays. There are a few people who can, who can manage or continue to do both, but starting from scratch at this point in time might not be the right thing to do in all honesty. And then do you feel you've reached, uh, you've kind of learned as much as there is? Is there still room to learn and improve? Or you think that you've reached kind of a very good point and uh, things are there? No, I guess there's a long way to go. So, I mean, one thing I, I haven't mentioned is uh, what really drew me besides the initial enthusiasm, initial frustration with CTO PCI is once I got close to the community, it's an incredibly supportive community. So... Uh, I would see you walking in a meeting and I'll just show you a, a complex or a failed case and you would spare no energy or time in, in explaining, okay, so this is what I would have done if I were you. And um, I think it's it's this supportive community that has enabled many of us to become good operators, but it also paves the way for getting even better. And, uh, you know, the meetings, it's not just what's happening in the lectures or the live transmissions. It's also what happens in the hallway, in the chatting between sessions, uh, dare I even say in the bar after the meeting. But it's, it's all um, a superb opportunity to learn. And the, the community is incredibly supportive. So uh, I plan to make use of that as I go along. And uh, I just, so I would say that the, the vast majority of solid programs have or and 90, 92, 93% success rate. But uh, that's one angle to the story. Uh, it's, again, how efficient are you in terms of time, contrast, radiation. So I think there's a lot of room for improvement in those areas as well. And also, you've been functioning sometimes with not the same uh, equipment availability. Like, I know, for example, the sexual reentry is not as available due to cost issues in Egypt and other parts of the world. How are you able to uh, get through these limitations of not having potentially everything that you might want to have for your cases? So, yeah, the, the, there are the challenges, obviously. And uh, I think one, one important thing w when one is considering starting a CTO program is making sure that he or she has the right environment. And the environment is not just about the person or the operator. It also involves the team, it involves the uh, supported management, it involves the, uh, the supported financial part. So again, I've, I've been privileged and lucky on that end because uh, my hospital administration, okay, this is a good program, the results are good, 
we're benchmarking against other programs in the US and Europe, and we want to support you. So I would say I didn't face a lot of problems in terms of equipment deficiency, but early on, yeah, we didn't have dedicated ADR devices. The Stingray wasn't in Egypt till three or four years ago, so that was a challenge. But it also paved the way for an opportunity is we we had to become very good with epicardial collaterals early on. So I think that, that allowed me to uh, hone in and, and improve my retrograde experience very early on, especially with complex epicardials. And then do you also train the other staff, the nurses, the techs? Do you do any specific for them so they're more knowledgeable about what is going on in the cath lab? Yeah, absolutely, Manus. And I think the uh, while initially I wasn't doing that in a didactic fashion, uh, I was sort of taking the opportunity of pre-case planning and revision to just introduce all the concepts to the team. So during the procedure, everyone will more or less be on the same page. So uh, when we started off, I mean, it was it was difficult to get everyone on board. But nowadays, in the cath lab or the cath lab nurse or tech, they would say, okay, we're spotting something. I think the, the next thing is going to be a retrograde. This is, we have no idea where your anti-grade gear is. Don't you think we want to go retrograde to resolve the ambiguity now? So, yeah, it, it happens with time. But I would say the, the reviewing the angiogram pre and post, as a matter of fact, is a golden opportunity to uh, sort of it's not just for the for the service perspective or the procedures perspective. It's also a very good chance to make sure that everyone is gradually getting on board. Perfect. So, Ahmed, again, you've done a phenomenal world building, one of the best programs in Egypt and in the whole area as well, and teaching many people. And thank you again so much for the progress, being part of the Progress City Omenada, which is now more than a thousand patients and growing. So, again, it's been phenomenal work in all the aspects. If you have to give any last pieces of advice for people who are interested in learning this, what would be your advice to them? Um, I mean, the, the, this is a difficult job. It, uh, it will require the, the long hours. It will require the commitment. But then again, it's, it's very much similar to every other thing you want to master. Uh, perhaps with CTU and complex PCI, there is more to what you need to do in order to achieve uh, a good result. It will entail a lot of work on your behalf. There's the, the technical part, there's the mindset, there's the training, but there's also making sure that you have this right environment set up. Uh, if you think this is what you want to do and you're willing to put in the, the hours and the hard work, if you're willing to, and I think this is mm, a concept which is slightly difficult for us as cardiologists rather than interventional cardiologists to accept the, the concepts of utility and to, to accept that you're probably going to be failing more than any other person in your cath lab who's doing your non-complex so non-CTO PCI, uh, then it's, it's incredibly rewarding. I mean, I know that nowadays I like seeing fellows who are becoming more and more interested in the CHIP CTO arena uh, and uh, I think it's much better than, than having the mindset where ah, I just want to become another mediocre interventionist doing a type A and a type B lesion. So the interest is growing. Uh, it's a lot of hard work, but uh, you, you need to be humble about it, and it will take some time. Wonderful. Well, once again, Ahmed, thank you again so much. Uh, tremendous speaking to you today. A lot of pearls of wisdom for people to grow and hopefully try to reach uh, the level that you have in your lab. So thanks again for everything you have done and uh, we'll see you at the meeting soon. Manos, an absolute pleasure. Thank you. It's an honor being with you today and thank you for everything you've been doing to the to the entire community. Lovely being with you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Sensei Podcast. 